Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I would like to welcome you to today's program, which is How to Uncover Diverse Voices for Research and Teaching Strategies with Primary Source, Ar <laughs> Strategies with Primary Source Archives, which is sponsored by ProQuest. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60 minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I would like to point out just a couple of features of the webinar software. Um, first off, all of the attendees who are joining the presentation today are automatically muted and your cameras are disabled. Uh, so please don't worry about generating noise or feedback or any of that stuff. We've got that taken care of. Um, in the main area of the screen, when we start sharing, uh, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. And we are using the Q&A feature today. So if you have uh, questions for, for our speaker, please use it um, throughout the presentation to drop those questions in. Um, at the end of the session, we'll take some time to answer as many questions as we have time for. Um, often we have more questions than our, our time will allow for, so if we don't get to your question, we apologize in advance, um, and, but we'll do our best. <laughs> so please do uh, put your questions in. And also note that we are recording today's program and that everyone who re registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. Today, our speaker is uh, Marsha Chatlin, Professor of History and African American Studies at Georgetown University. Dr. Chatlin teaches about women's and girls' history, as well as Black capitalism. Her latest book, Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, examines the intricate relationship among African American politicians, civil rights organizations, communities, and the fast food industry. An active public speaker and educational consultant, Chatlin has received numerous awards and honors, in 2016, the Chronicle of Higher Education named her a top influencer in academia in recognition of her social media campaign, hashtag Ferguson Syllabus. So with that, we are ready to get started and I will turn things over to you, Dr. Chatlin. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you, um, ProQuest, for inviting me to talk about my research and the links between um, two seemingly disparate projects. And as someone who came into the historical profession um, at a time when emerging scholars were just stepping into the world of digital archives, just stepping into thinking about the ways that we share um, uh, information via different platforms, I think that I have really benefited from a lot of the innovations that organizations like ProQuest have led in making um, primary source documents available to more and more people. So today's presentation is going to look at the process um, that I used for two of my two books. And then I'd love to have a conversation with um, the folks in the webinar about kind of research challenges that you may have faced. So at this time, I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation and we can go from there. So, my introduction um, to the study of history came through um, examinations of Black women's history. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with how Black women's history emerged um, within the field of history, is that Black women's history is very much a reflection of changes in academia as well as articulations of social movements impact in academia in the 1970s. And so beginning in the late 70s and early 1980s, um, there were more and more um, books written about Black women's experience and taking very seriously the ways that gender and race interacted. And so in those early days of Black women's history, a lot of the dissertations that later would become monographs were dependent on a pretty narrow view of archive. And that was because of the, um, the questions about how to access Black women's stories and the fact that there were still collections to be processed and made available. So in a lot of those early pieces, um, you see 
histories of people like Ida B. Wells Barnett, who left behind her Memphis diaries, as well as other um, signs of her prolific work in anti-lynching, as well as suffrage, because she was a woman of prominence. Another woman who appears in my first book, um, Southside Girls, Amanda Smith, was a leading figure in the African Methodist and Episcopal Church. And so women like Amanda Smith, um, women like Ida B. Wells Barnett, they were often the focus of this early work. In addition to these figures, members of the National Association of Colored Women, women who for the most part, but not entirely, were members of an educated elite, some were college graduates who left their papers behind. And historians know this challenge of how do we tell stories of people who are not among the upper echelons of leaders, people who did not have the privilege of a platform to appear in um, publications regularly, people who are not affiliated with the types of organizations that have the capacity to have their papers preserved. So how do we do this? And so when I was in graduate school at Brown University, I was among, I would say, the second to two and a half generation of women who were training in Black women's history, who were trying to tell um, different stories about race and gender. And so I landed upon the topic of African American girlhood during Chicago's Great Migration because I was one, I was desiring um, a way of talking about the distinct ways that age, race, and gender worked together in constituting the African American experience to try to think about the ways that African-American adults broadly thought of girls and girlhood during a time of major transition. And in my training in Black women's history, I saw a lot of work that talked about girls, but didn't include girls' voices within the frame of the narrative text. So a lot of that early work about women's clubs are all, were also pivoting around this idea of Black women in civil society and public service. And so there were books about juvenile institutions that Black women created, boarding houses, as well as the incredible impact of Black women educators. But for me, I really wanted to see the ways how girls and teenage women appeared in the archive. And this was, I think, the first time I realized that the appeal of being a historian for me is really trying to find the story that doesn't quite emerge um, so easily. And I enjoyed the challenge of trying to find ways to bring Black girls' voices into view in order to take a different look at a period of history that had been written about extensively, that had been covered in a lot of different genres, but I felt like was still incomplete because we didn't know how Black girls and teenage women were experiencing the mass exodus of African Americans from the South to Northern cities during the first half of the 20th century. And so in the process of writing the book Southside Girls, in converting my dissertation into a monograph, I was really pushed by advisors and readers of the manuscript to really find the ways to bring Black girls' voices into the text. And while a lot of people questioned whether that was possible, it required me to kind of rethink all of the different ways that I had been trained to think about archive. And so I think there were a series of faulty assumptions. Um, so the first one was that um, my role as a historian was to give a voice to the voiceless. That by isolating girls and young women, I was providing this opportunity for us to try to find their voices. But soon I discovered that actually a lot of girls and young women um, had a voice during this period of time that their voice had not been considered important enough or valuable enough to make it into um, secondary source documents. And what do I mean by that? Well, one of the breakthroughs that I had in the research um, for my book was finding a set of interviews that sociologist E. Franklin Frazier conducted throughout the early 20th century in Chicago with African-American girls whose families had migrated from Chicago and some had sought resources for, from his Institute for Juvenile Research because they had unplanned pregnancies or that they had become wards of the state. 
Now, Chicago has a very sophisticated system of record keeping as a result of the juvenile courts, which were established there in the 1890s. But one of the challenges of accessing juvenile court records, besides the ones of confidentiality, is that a lot of what is in those files are adults' um, renderings of the problems of young people. So rarely do we get this voice. And so in the last kind of push to try to bring black girl voices into my manuscript, I thought to myself, if Chicago was the center of all of this groundbreaking research on the African-American family, surely there had to have been some interviews with black girls. If you look at the entirety of the text of E. Franklin Frazier's Negro Family in Chicago, there may be four, if that, maybe even three quotes directly from black girls. But I knew that Frazier was a meticulous researcher, that he had trained many graduate students under him. And so I went and I looked at his papers, not in the drafts of Negro Family in Chicago, but to look at the actual research that was done. And in that process, I literally found a, an entire folder that was bound that said interviews with Negro girls. And it was this, um, it was this like um, movie moment of discovering the archives, even though movies usually show people looking at microfilm. It was this incredible moment in the archives where all of the information that I had been spending years searching for were right there. But I think that it was illustrative of the ways that scholars often assume archives um, are comprised of the things that are most cited. And so we have finding aids, but we know that finding aids are always um, subject to a little bit of confusion. Um, there are a number of collections that need updated finding aids. But when I was looking at these incredible interviews um, that Frazier was engaging with, with girls who were 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, talking about what they felt about their parents, talking about their relationships at school, talking about sex and dating and their impressions of Chicago and their memories of the South, what I realized was that I had thought that this was going to be some um, kind of gymnastics life process in trying to get those voices out, but those voices were there. But what was absent was an academic framework that validated those voices and actually pushed them through to research. And so um, I think that the lesson there is you have to go to the archive and the finding aid is sometimes um, an obstruction because you have to actually look at the documents to understand uh, what's there and what the finding aid can't capture. Um, the other faulty assumption that I was making as an emerging scholar was that, that I was the only smart thinker in the world and that's kind of in jest, but what that meant was what I had lost sight of was the importance of um, dissertations and master's degree theses for my research. And so I had been trained to read the book first, look at the citations, and then go to WorldCat or whichever um, kind of archival, um, you know, disaggregator that you go to, and then look for the papers. But one of the things that it occurred to me while I was working on Southside Girls was that a lot of the questions about African Americans and girlhood were not questions that I had simply come up with in the early 2000s, that these were enduring questions that, was, that were framing um, how people talked about race, how people talked about public policy, questions about segregation and contested spaces in Chicago, and that if I as a graduate student was thinking about this, surely other graduate students and generations past had asked this. And the University of Chicago was one of um, the handful of elite institutions that had actually admitted African Americans and admitted women um, in graduate programs in the early 20th century. And so I started looking at the dissertations that came out of the University of Chicago as another type of primary source. And so I think that when I was in graduate school, we were often advised to look at other dissertations um, in order to think about the framing of how our peers during a particular period of time thought about questions. But within the context of the types of dissertations that were being written at the University of Chicago in sociology and urban ecology and social work, 
there were a treasure trove of, again, interviews and transcripts of the types of conversations that African-American girls were having with people who were um, involved in the emerging uh, discipline of social work about their private experiences about schooling and family and sex and relationships. And that became an incredible source for me to find girls in places that we don't traditionally send our graduate student trainees, in my, in my case, to the archive. Um, the other faulty assumption that I think was so important for, um, for me and other people who have taken seriously the history of um, childhood and youth is that we started to think about children's organizations um, not in terms of places in which leisure activity happens, but places in which policy and um, contentions about space and ideas about the family, ideas about gender can also emerge. And so in thinking about the ways that African-American girls created a social life, created a life of leisure outside of the context of their families, sources like um, the Girl Scouts of Chicago, sources like the Chicago Community Trust became incredibly helpful in thinking about race relations. And again, um, a lot of the research that I had seen about some of these um, organizations like the Settlement House Movement that we associated with Jane Addams, a lot of these spaces I thought of as mo monoethnic or monocultural because they were designed for particular immigrant groups or they served in particular communities. But one of the things that I had to understand is that at the point in which there's this mass migration of African Americans, there's a lot of anxiety about how children are going to contend with this change in racial demographic. And while some of these organizations excluded or segregated African Americans, it didn't mean that they weren't engaged in conversations about them. And so looking at children's organizations and the ways that they were challenged um, by the color line or accommodated the color line was also a helpful way for me to get those voices out. Um, some of the most amazing research um, that I found for my book came from the notes of camp counselors who were part of an experiment in seeing if black and white children can go to camp together. And so while that source, again, would never be within the frame of African American history. It would not be considered one of the um, Black Studies resources of the Chicago History Museum. It spoke volumes about the ways that race was understood, not only by African American girls, but those around them. And so thinking about the spaces in which contestations can happen can also help you bring some voices that um, you don't automatically think of as part of a set of experiences or organizations. Um, and one of the things I think um, intellectually I had to really think about as a scholar is that when we think about contributions, when we think about what is meritorious about a legacy, we often think about um, it in very kind of narrow terms. So we think of either the first person to do something a person who invented something, or a person who was um, elevated as a great leader. But when you write the history of children, particularly African American children, particularly African American girls, you have to rethink what a contribution is. And for me, what I discovered in the process of writing Southside Girls, a contribution is giving voice to a set of problems. A contribution means that you appear outside of the roles that you are confined by or consigned to and you speak out. And so in thinking about the use of Black girls' experiences for the purpose of this book, um, using the kind of ProQuest um, historical newspapers, looking at the Black Studies Center that um, ProQuest provides with the Schomburg Library, looking at articles like this with the headline, Girls in YW Drive Tell of Their Hardships, I started to really value what that meant, that it wasn't just about some girls talking about the problems of racism and sexism. It is a contribution to our ability to not only understand this period of time, but modes of learning. And I think that the fact that the Black 
Press included so many different um, events. I mean, look at this uh, page of text. There's so much going on, every meeting, people visiting from far locations, um, African-Americans getting the chance to travel, understanding that these black newspapers were chronicling so many of the micro details of black life also helps us kind of expand the vision of voice and importance and elevation because um, black agency was so deeply celebrated and any kind of barrier crossing was um, a reason for a story. And so I can't tell you the number of times that I would see items about black girls being allowed to um, go to a certain parade or go to a Girl Scout camp or to meet Eleanor Roosevelt at a National Youth Administration uh, summer program. And the, the chronicling of these, I think, were also really helpful for me to understand what did it mean for people to see girls' advancements or girls' achievements as an extension of the desires of African Americans that they hoped would be fulfilled with the great um, migration experience. And so, if anything, I often tell my graduate students, I don't know if Southside Girls is a good book, but I can say this. Southside Girls was an opportunity to really push myself to think about archive and to think about what is possible in terms of research um, across a number of uh, subfields. And one of the greatest things about being a historian is that it's not just about starting conversations, because I think rarely do we start a conversation that has never been had, but we can intervene in conversations. And so I am very proud to have um, had Southside Girls come out around a time period in which scholars across various disciplines were asking questions about how do we understand African-American girlhood. Um, historical books like Crescent City Girls by Lakeisha Michelle Simmons, who's at University of Michigan, looks at black girls in New Orleans. Shape Shifters by um, uh, Amy Meredith Cox, who's at Yale, that looks at, from an anthropological perspective, black girls in a dance program in Detroit. And Nazira Sadiq Wright of the University of Kentucky, who's looking at Black girlhood's representation in literary culture. And the numbers of history publications and journals that were looking at this question about the possibility of making Black girlhood studies something that can create a new framework for understanding, again, these intersections of race, gender, and age has been so exciting. And so we do the work of bringing the voices in, not just for the sake of saying that we did it, but we see um, the ways that this research can animate how people in the present, <laughs> excuse me, will be more perceptive and more um, thoughtful in bringing the stories of Black girls um, into the frame in various institutional contexts. And it's so exciting the ways that um, Southside Girls has helped uh, create a series of walking tours in Chicago about um, Black Women's Chicago, um, Southside Girls, among other publications, were included in a report recently done by Georgetown University's Law Center about the crisis of Black girls in suspensions in schools. And so there's a lot of ways in which um, showing um, that this research is deeply grounded can then uh, create all sorts of possibilities in the present. And so now I want to transition to my most recent book, uh, Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America. And this archival challenge was a little bit different. Um, I wanted to explore this idea of how McDonald's became black. And while we know that McDonald's is consumed all over the world, there is a distinct way in which McDonald's has intersected with African-American institutions and peoples that, was, that has been a source of curiosity for me for a very long time as someone who also studies um, food history. And so the first question I always get when I talk about this book is people say, well, did McDonald's open up their archive to you? And the answer is no, McDonald's did not open up its archive to me. McDonald's does have a full-time archivist and it has its own collections, but it was not available to me. And for people who um, do business history, this can always seem like a set of challenges. What happens when institutional papers aren't available? What does it mean when you are granted access to an institution's papers in terms of your relationship with that institution? And so I was incredibly excited having felt very, um, uh, having learned so much from the challenge of Southside Girls to jump into the story of McDonald's. So this project required me to ask different questions about relationships. 
Um, and one of the challenges that I initially started as someone who had worked in so many papers of individuals who were parts of organizations was how do I get at a corporation? And um, this is a riff off of Mitt Romney's comment in the 2012 election, which feels like a hundred years ago um, that corporations are people. So we know that corporations are people. And so their presence in the archive can be very different and very challenging for those of us who are used to using um, family papers and personal papers as source material. But corporations interact with people and have friends. And so one of my first stops in thinking about this is thinking about the ways that McDonald's appears in the archives of black historical newspapers. And then thinking about the stories I read and some of the conflicts that emerged around McDonald's and African-American communities. And so one place I found this was in Portland, Oregon, where the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, their chapter in Oregon was accused of bombing a McDonald's um, in retaliation for refusal to participate in the breakfast program for children. That was kind of intriguing to me. So I flew to Portland back when we could do that. And I started to look at the papers of both the Black Panther Party, as well as some papers in the state um, archive. And I saw a lot about McDonald's vis-a-vis -vis, um, some police surveillance that I'm sure was coordinated with FBI surveillance of this Black Panther group. And so while the, the archive, right, the papers might be um, in line with what we think of, okay, this is about a Black um, political organization, when you actually went through the papers, there was quite a bit, not only about McDonald's in this particular context, but African-American feelings about Black, um, about McDonald's and Black community. And there was evidence that this uh, chapter of the party in protesting McDonald's was also engaged in conversations with other Black organizations that were questioning the appropriateness of McDonald's in their community. Um, as I read the stories um, from the Black uh, Study Center and all the newspaper coverage of McDonald's, I also saw a lot of stories in which um, McDonald's Black franchise owners were getting into conflicts with McDonald's corporate about access to franchising. And this is something that resonates today in light of a recent lawsuit on, on the part of 52 franchise owners against McDonald's for racial discrimination. And I noticed the names of Black mayors would often appear in these stories. So I took a plane to Los Angeles and I realized that black mayors, particularly those that were elected in the late 60s, in the 1980s and the early 1990s, had to often run on a pro-business platform, even if they were part of a generation of radical, anti-corporate kind of anti-capitalists, when they were running for office, they were often talking about being um, pro-business and open to Black-owned business. And within that frame, there is so much about McDonald's. Um, McDonald's representatives meeting with these mayors, the mayors getting in the middle of these conversations. And again, when we think about the context of African-American mayors, we think about them in terms of political victories of being the first, but the substance of the work that they had to do often followed a pattern. And once I noticed that pattern, I realized just how often McDonald's and material about McDonald's, annual reports, franchise applications, also appear in their papers. Um, corporations can buy friends and influence people. Um, in my book, I looked at the ways that McDonald's supported the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, uh, programs like the Gospel Music Tour, including um, recent tours that um, continue as well as activities like the McDonald's Double Dutch Team. And in thinking about the different ways corporate sponsorship has also facilitated this relationship, I was able to look at the papers of the Martin Luther King Jr. Um, Holiday Commission and finding the corporation. So here is a story where I'm telling a corporate story, but by putting African Americans at the center of it, I'm able to get that story without having to deal with the, um, the limited access to McDonald's corporate archives. Um, government is a friend of corporations and they influence policy. And so when I started to think of McDonald's as part of the um, 
constellation of black policy leaders and influencers, I started to see um, opportunities to learn more about their practices in African-American communities, looking at people like Richard Nixon, who was a big proponent of black owned businesses and black capitalism. People like Julian Bond, who was a huge supporter of fast food franchising and is actually the voiceover um, for the National Black McDonald's Operators Association kind of mini documentary. Julian Bond franchised a Dairy Queen too in Atlanta. And so going into the papers of Julian Bond to try to find fast food was another way in which um, I think the complexity and the diversity of black experiences in the context of business his history was able to emerge. And often when we think about doing research in black business history, we only focus on black business owners and that loses sight of the ways that the move for black owned businesses and the call to buy black was a capacious part of um, black political life. Um, and so this is just my own kind of note about uh, doing business history. Fast food corporations can feed us and starve us at the same time, but can't deny us all the information we seek. And so for people who are trying to do this type of history, I really do encourage you to think about the kind of center frame of how you want to tell this story um, because you will be pleasantly surprised at times the ways that um, business history and corporate history can emerge in unlikely places. And just a, um, a nod to some of the wonderful sources that I was able to use to tell the story of McDonald's. Again, sources that are not associated with McDonald's, but when I started to think a little bit more broadly about the story I was trying to tell, McDonald's appeared everywhere. Um, the papers of the Congress of Racial Equality and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, again, civil rights organizations that are associated with the sit-in strategy, even though most of us um, in our historical memory think of sit-ins as being um, activist actions that were taken in brands that are probably no longer with us. Uh, there's very few Rexall drugs left. Katz's is no longer in business. Woolworth's closed about 20 years ago, but McDonald's was actually a target of quite a bit of sit-in activity. And it was knowing these civil rights groups and just trying to kind of think about targets that I was able to discover a great deal about McDonald's relationship to civil rights um, political action. In addition, the NAACP papers, right? Knowing the importance of civil rights organizations to business development, especially after 1968, uncovered all sorts of information about McDonald's and black communities. Um, and so these are some of the goodies that I found about core um, leader hints at drive against chain. And so this is about targeting McDonald's and this is very small print. So I'll let you know, this is about, this is an injunction that um, a McDonald's franchise owner in uh, Pine Bluff, Arkansas filed against civil rights activists for boycotting and picketing his restaurant because of their segregation habits. And this is a letter um, written from San Jose, California um, from members of SNCC about a McDonald's action. And um, I've read quite a bit of civil rights history and there isn't a lot of texts that include McDonald's within the larger frame of the sit-in movement. And that information may be uh, periphery, peripheral for another scholar, but for me, it was really at the center of my analysis of McDonald's. And so um, in a nutshell, this is how kind of searching the archive, looking for those diverse voices um, has enhanced my personal research agenda. I'm going to show you two um, research assignments or two classroom assignments that I've done with students about archives to help them understand how we um, find voices. And then I would love to open it up for questions um, from the audience. So the first one is a lab that I created for a course we teach at Georgetown University called History 099, um, which is a methods class. It is a class that has a theme but we're supposed to show undergraduates the tools of being a historian. This course can be kind of challenging. You have first year students in their first semester of college, and then you have all the seniors who never took the class in their first year. So you have a wide array of students. It is for non-history majors. And so one of the ways that we do this is we have a lecture 
one day and then the next day we have a lab. And so the first lab that I created for the students is what's an archive. And so I try to explain to them um, why historians use archives, um, where you find it, why it's different than the types of things that you can borrow from a library, which many of you know that some archives are digital. And so I help them think about how historians develop a topic. And so we talk about using WorldCat, we talk about how to search finding aid, we talk about evaluating the results of a finding aid, and then um, due to the digital access of um, civil, right act, civil rights activist Rosa Parks' papers, um, I teach them how to read um, a document um, from an archive, and then we look at documents together and the types of ideas that can percolate from looking at a, doc a document. And I think that this um, collection is just so amazing um, and it's very well organized. And there's actually a picture of Rosa Parks at a McDonald's that didn't make it into my book, but it's a pretty amazing picture. Um, she's at the kind of um, burger station with a black franchise owner of a McDonald's, I believe in Atlanta or Detroit. So um, I show them how a historian reads a document, like, a document like this. And so this one would say, um, this one would lead me to wonder about perceptions of Rosa Parks after the 1950s. Um, kind of what I can glean from the details of a document. Um, and then there is an address. So kind of ask myself, where is that? And the businesses that sponsor this event, you know, what are the significance of these businesses? And then I teach students how to cross-reference um, using ProQuest newspapers. Um, and we put in the address. I did this live in class and I just prayed that it worked and it did. And it shows some supplementary material about that particular flyer. And then I look at the quotes from the article at that time. I look at the different kind of information that these articles give me and then um, how to develop historical insight from what you find in the archive. And students at various levels can really appreciate this. I do a version of this with um, a piece of long form journalism. There was an article that was written by um, um, Josh Levin um, in the lead up to his book that came out two years ago um, called um, about the, the origins of the myth of the welfare queen about uh, Linda Taylor, and it was a long form article that had been reported in Slate. And I had them read the article, and then we went through the different places where you would get the kinds of information that's reported in a long form article so that they understand that the use of primary source documents, the use of databases, the use of archive isn't just for historians, that writers in various contexts, that people in business sometimes use these. Um, materials as well to try to help them understand that these are documents and these are opportunities for everyone to gain greater insight. Um, the second project that I like to do with students is about film. So we do a project where we annotate the movie Selma and um, we watch the entire movie and then I show them clips of the film and then I compare it to real life and I say if you were going to fictionalize the story of Selma, what are the historical documents and um, archives that are available to you for you to write a kind of script. And so um, in thinking about the portrayal of Dr. Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King's marriage, I point them to Stanford University's um, King Institute and this Valentine, which is um, an incredibly heady Valentine that Martin Luther King sent his wife. Um, I talk about the ways that um, the film Selma does not have a direct, um, does not quote Martin Luther King directly. And we talk about issues of um, permission and reproduction in terms of uh, sources. And so I show this uh, clip where Dr. King is accepting the Nobel Prize in 1964. And I explain to them that the speech that is given in the film is not the real speech. And we look at the difference. This is the actual speech. Um, I talk about the Birmingham church bombing, which is a feature in the film, and um, about the use of um, the National Park Services and these National Historic Sites 
as another way in which we can get historical information. Um, we talk about voter suppression, how it's represented again in the film, and um, this links to um, the SNCC papers and information about voter suppression in Mississippi. Um, I explained to them how you know what a president talked to about with someone in the White House, and I show them um, the LBJ recordings from the LBJ Presidential Library. Um, I look at character studies like Diane Nash, who's played by Tessa Thompson in the film. And then we look at fashion libraries and we talk about material culture archives and the importance of um, those types of libraries in not only set design, but also in preservation of textiles and materials. And then we talk about J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI files on Martin Luther King Jr. among other activists. And then the final note is about the various leaders of the civil rights movement who are portrayed in the film and who they are in real life. And um, this links to the History Makers uh, project out of Chicago and the incredible interviews that are available from people who kind of made history. Um, and so with that, I just want to, um, again, express my gratitude to all the librarians and all of the um, archivists and all of the people who, who allow um, me to um, indulge my passions and my questions. And so now I will open it up to uh, the Q&A. Thank you so much. Um, the first one, oh, Hoya Saxon from a Georgetown alum working at Mizzou. Hello, Rachel. Thank you for that. Um, so, um, Lena asked, you said that sometimes finding aids can be a hindrance to research. Are there changes that can be made on our work as archivists to better serve the material and researchers in the context of diverse voices? I simply need maybe $500,000 if anyone has it lying around. I would love to create a network, and I've, I've thought about different ways of doing this, but I've never come up with a good way of it of creating kind of pods of people to hack the finding aids where scholars who have just recently published books or just finished dissertations, because that's when you really kind of know your material the best, to go back in and annotate finding aids and doing it. Is there someone already doing this? Is this does this already exist, Mark? I don't know. Maybe it does. Do you know of anyone doing this? Not that I'm aware of, but no. I would ask <laughs> if anyone out there does. I think this would be a great project. You can get undergraduates and graduate students and just make notes and finding aids and click maybe, you know, having links to click to our books that have used it or like putting little, like, I just think about all the post-it notes that should be on every finding aid that I've ever used. Um, that could be an amazing process. It seems to require a lot of money and, um, I don't know, maybe someone from Mellon's in the audience. <laughs> this is, I know there are a lot of pressing things that are happening right now, but that could be among uh, a research priority. All right. Um, I just, you know, I think finding aids are so, um, you know, they're, they're, our first, they're our first line of defense, but again, I just don't know how we animate them um, for the inaccuracies. I guess maybe it's just an editing project that you could bring people together who've used these, um, these materials in a really, really um, kind of intense way and try to get them uh, making notes. Um, what is your experience of the accuracy of full text searching in ProQuest? How good is the OCR for newspapers you've used as sources? Um, oh, hey, I found that some newspapers are better scanned than others. I agree with you. Um, Yes, I agree 100%. Um, sometimes the OCR isn't the best. Um, it's what we've got. And this is why I think um, I try to tell my graduate students that back when we could go places that you start there. But sometimes um, if you come upon research files that just have newspaper clippings, actually go through those as well. Because I think that there's a lot of stuff that isn't, isn't captured. Um, Um, I think I, I love finding aids. I think they just need to be updated. This is interesting. Um, great. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Um, how might archives and surface sources that can voice the marginalized? 
Um, you know, I think um, the practice that I've seen at a lot of great archives is to, you know, they always have that shelf, you know, from our archives, these books emerged. And I think um, showing that connection of how a particular set of papers was able to inform work across different topic areas, because um, I think that there were a number of papers that I used that I think it would be really um, helpful or affirmative for people to say that actually this is a source in African American history, or this can be a source for this, I think it might be the first part. Um, you know, and I think that, um, you know, archivists and special collections are doing a great job of saying that, you know, these are the voices that come out. Um, I've seen some really great projects where people are using, you know, social media to say like, this document is here and this is something that's emerging, but I think it has to really be a stronger partnership between professional historians who are using this material, spending time um, with the librarians and archivists that um, help them on their projects to how to um, communicate that to a larger audience about what's possible. Um, McDonald's corporate archives were just closed, or maybe they were just closed to me, but they do not let outsider, outside researchers uh, use their materials. Um, genealogists also face some of these challenges, absolutely, about finding information. Ooh, indexing and transcription projects and parties is an excellent place to kind of crowdsource. And I think it also is something that we can do in the context of um, work from home. Um, cursive, oh, that's a great question. I went to Catholic school at the risk of um, kind of perpetuating a stereotype. So my cursive is impeccable and I was trained in cursive. Cursive is increasingly becoming a challenge for um, my younger students, um, but I, I have not had serious challenges with cursive, especially since I work in the 20th century. Some of the material from the 19th century is uh, difficult. For contemporary business history, sometimes the issue isn't cursive, it's the bad mimeograph quality um, in the papers. Um, I, I'm glad I got something going with the questions about the finding aids. I'm glad we're all thinking about the different ways of um, taking those schemes. And you know I, what I think does enhance the finding aid? Um, that narrative, um, and depending on um, the institution, some do it better than other, that narrative paragraph at the beginning of the, the, the aid, the scope paragraph, I think can also be really um, helpful um, if it has dynamic links, if it uses timelines. Um, I think it would be really amazing if there were projects that took items from the collection and used it in that introductory paragraph so that scholars can see the kind of scope of what's being um, looked at. I think we just have to really um, think about the template we use for that material. Um, let's see. So um, if you have a subscription to Black Study Center, you're able, depending on um, what your institution subscribes to, you're able to just get um, all of the search um, results from the Chicago Defender, I think the Baltimore Afro-American, um, I think it's just called ProQuest Black, Historical Black Newspapers, I can't remember the formal title, but there is a way to just get um, items from the Black press. And this can also be an incredible project for your students to think about a particular moment and then think about the ways it's being reported in the Black press versus other press sources. Um, I worked with a student on a senior thesis about the, in, the reintroduction of the death penalty in the state of California. And it was really interesting for him to read the Los Angeles Sentinel and think about how black newspapers were thinking about this issue um, in opposition to some of the editorials in the Los Angeles Times. Um, so for teaching, um, how long do these projects take? So the one with the Rosa Parks papers, the labs that we had for that course was um, maybe 50 minutes. And so I can kind of, I walk them through the process. And then for the assignment, I had the students do the same thing where they looked at an item in that collection, thought about how they can um, follow up or corroborate some of the claims in there, find 
the cross-reference and then write a historically informed paragraph. It's something that students can do as homework. Um, the one about annotating Selma, that one I was just having so much fun with. Um, it's, it's having them watch the film, which they can do at home if you're in a virtual learning situation, and then pulling out um, the places in which um, they can be directed. Um, and so I hope this helps for your folklore class in an English department. Um, yes, so this is really important. So, you know, graduate student careers that lead to library and information resources, working in archives, getting their foot in the door about collections, because collections are also political. The assessment of what's of value and what's not of value is so important for institutions and making sure that our graduate students are trained um, in a way to understand the complexity and the diversity of the nation's history to make a decision about where to invest, I think is, is key. Um, do I ever use Happy Trust for massive full text searching? I have, I don't have strong opinions about it. Hi, Sandy. Um, Thank you for that comment about um, how we contribute to, we intervene in conversations, we don't start them. Thank you, and it's good to see you. Um, um, you know, that's a very good point about the fact that a lot, of our, a lot of materials and a lot of finding aids aren't digital. And so the question about how we make sure that people have good information about the net, about the content of archives is still um, in, in, a challenge for libraries um, to, to consider and to think about how then that opens up the possibility for uh, emerging scholars to use those materials. Um, I have not come across um, material on a Southside teacher named Mary J. Herrick, but if any place would have it, it would be um, the Carter G. Woodson Regional Library in the Vivian Harsh Collection. And the Vivian Harsh Collection was an incredible um, source for my book. Um, I was working on another project about African Americans in education in Chicago, and I came upon the papers of a market research firm called Viewpoint. And it had tons of stuff about McDonald's, as well as other fast food and commercial brands. And I thought to myself, gosh, this isn't a business library. Um, but it was a library that's devoted to African Americans in Chicago broadly defined. And so even I had a preconceived notion of the types of materials that they would keep. And the viewpoint papers are some of the greatest source materials on this relationship between African Americans and the commercial marketplace. Um, oh, good. So people are crowdsourcing and tagging digitized material, which I did know but never heard of this being done with finding aids. So we have, um, we have a framework. Um, the Black Metropolis Project in Chicago is associated with the Vivian Harsh Collection that I had mentioned earlier. Um, it's been a great resource with um, providing funds for, um, providing funds for uh, short-term research, um, supporting emerging scholars. And, um, you know, the longtime archivist there was Michael Flug. And, you know, in a, like a lot of these collections within the framework of a larger public library system, we have these people who are just the institutional memory of those of these places. But when they, um, you know, retire, when they transition, how do we make sure that that knowledge is still there? Um, you know, the Black Metropolis um, Research Center has been in incredible work in the city of Chicago. And I think it's a really good example of scholars on a local level ensuring um, access to papers. And they've also been helpful in processing new papers that, you know, it radically changes um, the trajectory of African American history. Um, yes, uh, finding a wiki project, I think is a good start. Um, how do I feel about the quality quantity of digitized archive materials? You know, it's pretty good for me in the sense that I do 20th century um, history. Um, traveling to archives was often what I did um, when that material wasn't digital. Um, I think in our new kind of reality of both austerity and a pandemic, um, you know, we're just going to see more and more projects make the most out of digitizing con content. Um, I think what we also need to do is create an open source platform, and I'm sure people are already doing this, 
um, of saying what materials we do have in paper or what we have on our hard drives. Um, I've been trying to do this with students to you know, put out on Twitter. Does anyone have you know, digital copies of X, Y, and Z? Um, I have a treasure trove of paper from the days of paper um, before I had a digital camera and before my phone could be its archive um, you know, that I would love scholars to use. Um, I do think that there is something different that happens in the research process now that we can use our phones to capture documents. And I think that there's something to be said about um, having to transform our brains to be able to process the volume. The volume of material that I collected for this last book is maybe three or four times the first book. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a reflection of that much more research going into the second book, but it was the capacity to just snap pictures. And so now that I have all of these materials available, I hope that scholars can start exchanging them um, while we're trying to work from home. Um, if an archivist could visit your History 99 class for one session, what would you want them to share with your students? Um, I think that I would want students to understand that um, the, I often liken this, being a historian to my students to this, and this might not be the best way of putting it, but I often talk about how um, being a historian is the equivalent of being on Twitter and seeing that people are joking about something but not knowing what the original joke is. And the time you spend kind of unraveling the ball of yarn to get to its origins, there's a strange burst of accomplishment where you figure it out what everyone's talking about. That's how I feel when I step into an archive. Um, and I want students to understand that there is a sense of satisfaction of kind of solving it. I think of it more like a riddle or a detective work, right? There are a set of things that um, are incomplete within an archive and they, they, they are the beginning of a process, but they aren't necessarily an end. And the way that our creative mind can be activated by the possibility of trying to, trying to fit something within, um, within a place and a time is really, really fun and super rewarding. Um, someone is looking for information, folks, on the Black horticulturist that was hired by the University of Missouri in the 1870s and 80s. His name was Henry Kirkland. Um, if anyone has any information, please contact me to share this information. Henry Kirkland, a Black horticulturist. Um, this is an interesting puzzle. Um, you know, when I, there are a lot of African-American newspapers that are not full text um, digital. That's why clipping, newspaper clipping files, I still think are really helpful to look at. Um, part of my research brought, brought me to Emory's, um, Emory Library, Emory University's Rose Library, and they have extensive holdings on the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and civil rights organizations in Atlanta. And even though I had tons from the black press that came out of Atlanta. I was in those clipping files looking at every single one and you can't beat that um, because there's no question and there's no messiness with the digital process. Um, some people who've been working on this issue, Michelle Caswell, Tom Hyrie, and Michelle Light um, have explored ways to integrate feedback into finding aids and catalog records. Excellent. Um, can you imagine ways from your experience that historians might work with archives to crowdsource richer finding aids? Again, I think um, maybe this can become a feature of collections websites, some um, site that it leads you to where people are actively engaging in these questions. Um, someone mentioned that there are some good Wikidata archival projects that are happening right now and using flexible tools to work through metadata using all kinds of links. We have one minute left, so I'm gonna stop the questions there, but I was able to talk to a good chunk of you. Thank you so much um, for all of these great, um, these great questions. And yes, we have to be so careful about crowdsourced anything, but I think when we engage together, um, you know, we, I think we just do better in our practice. Thanks folks. Great, and, and thank you, Dr. Chatlin, um, for taking so many questions and, um, and just rolling right through them there at the end and for the presentation and for your research. Um, I would just say before we take off today, um, thank you to those of you out there listening in as well. Um, we hope to see you on another webinar in the near future. And if you have a little bit of time when you sign off, we have a, just a brief survey um, that we would love a little bit of feedback um, on.
And so once again, thank you all you out there listening in and, and thank you, Dr. Chatlin. We really appreciate the presentation. Thank you.